Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is a clip from my interview with ACDC engineer Mike Frazier. If you want to see the full interview, it's linked below. When Angus comes in to do his solos, you know, uh, he he never comes in with a written solo. So, you know, we'll come in and, okay, go and he'll play a thing. Wow, that's great. And says, oh, do you want another one? Okay, yeah, let's you know, see, see what else we got. But he'll play it completely different. So mm -hmm. sometimes you'll do five or six of those takes and you go, well, now which one do we pick? Because they're all great. So yeah. then you try and put a comp together, you know, piece a bit from here and a bit from there. And then that doesn't always work because sometimes, you know, he'd be playing up with his neck and then when he'd want to go to the next piece, he's down here. So it wouldn't sound natural, mm -hmm. you know, but you're trying to get all the best bits in, in one solo. So sometimes that's tricky. And then sometimes you're going, well, that was a great bit, but we can't make it work with all those other great bits. So that's just, just that first solo you played, Ang, let's go with that. It just sounded the best. So, you know, that's the only time you have to work with Angus. He's, he's very quick. With them, well, for the first few records I did with them, uh, it started with a, probably a, at least a semi-truck, maybe two of them would bring all their gear. So they had maybe 40 Marshall 4x12 cabinets and 35 various Marshall heads and stuff. So we the first, sometimes even a week before we started the recording, we'd go through every head, try and get the best sound out of that head. And then we'd try every cabinet. So we'd find which head matched best with mm -hmm. which cabinet. And we'd eliminate the ones that didn't make the cut and get rid of that, get rid of that. So we ended up having for, for Mal and Agnes, there was two different heads and I think two different cabinets, the A and the B team thing. So we used to go through the whole process every time. And finally on the third, third record we're doing, I said, look, why are we even bother bringing this other stuff? None of them ever sound any better. It's always A and B that end up making it. So that was kind of the records. So it started there. We'd get a great sound out in the studio, whatever the band's looking for, for that part and all that. And I would just have to duplicate it in the, in the control room, you know, which was fairly easy. Like their approach is, is always less is more. You know, the, the shortest guitar lead from the guitar to the uh, to the amp head is possible, as short as possible. And then the same with the speaker cord, as short as possible. And then I would shorten up mic cables. So, you know, we try and keep all the runs really short because then you're getting the full the full sound. And, uh, you know, once it, we're all happy out there, the guys would come in the control room and play in the control room for a little bit and go, yeah, that sounds great. Or, you know, hey, let's get a little bit more top end or that's too sparkly or whatever you know we dial it in and then they'd move back out there and we'd we'd nail the song so you know it, it was a little bit of a process but it's you know it's not rocket science it's just you just do it till it sounds right and then there's absolutely no layering like i said it's just mal one guitar ang one guitar and on some songs sometimes we like throw sort of like little power chord things in choruses just to have the chorus feel like it lifts a little more, mm -hmm. but they'd be way back in the mix. You wouldn't even notice that they're, they were in there, you know, now after all that's done, sometimes they'll go through and Angus will do lead guitars and stuff. And sometimes that's when they do the little <laughs> sound, you know, so there'll be other little sounds on top of that, but no doubling or tripling of, of rhythm guitars or anything. That's so cool. What was their creative chemistry like together in the studio? Were they bouncing ideas off each other? Like how did they work in cohesion? Yeah, well, they would. They had a little studio in, in London that they'd sit and do all their writing. So they'd come, you know, fairly prepared with songs uh, in various stages of completion. Sometimes they'd hash some of them out. So, you know, Mal and Ang would just sit there in the studio with the amps turned down low and just trying different things out. Uh, and, uh, you know, once they were happy, then we'd call the rest of the band in and away we went. Like when they were ready to play, then everybody came in, you know, they didn't have everybody sit there for hours. Let's try this. Let's try that. Cause they wanted everything always fresh. And, and I think a lot of the times when we started doing the records, I don't, I don't think a lot of the band, the other guys in the band had ever heard the song. Like they never really? believed in rehearsing for the record. Hmm. They wanted it to be fresh. The first time you played something and that's when the best stuff com comes instead of, you know, sitting there for days playing the same song over and over, you get kind of bored in the studio. You know, it's hard to keep yourself. There's not, you know, 40,000 fans getting you ex excited. So it's, you know, you got to be excited. Like, oh, this is a, oh, this is a, I love this song. And you get that on tape, you know. Sometimes that was second and third take. I think the most we'd take a song is maybe eight or 10 tries. But, you know, we'd do one, maybe two takes. 
and you know they'd be really intense and then we'd stop and they'd go have a cup of tea and a cup bunch of smokes like i say sometimes for an hour or two hours and then finally say oh gee it's three o'clock let's let's give that another go so they'd go in there and tune up and then bang and away they go and you know you could hear each different take was getting better and better and better and then finally the next one take wasn't as good as the last take Sometimes we'd try another one. No, that wasn't as good. So we'd go, okay, let's take that take. Gotcha. Is it the same with Cliff when it comes to bass? Yeah, he's a machine. <laughs> you know, him and Phil just, they just lock. And I think that's, you know, another secret to that band that, you know, Phil and, and Cliff just lock together and just mm -hmm. have that real simple sounding thing so that the guitars can sit on top of that, and just kind of smack you in the face. So, you know, he, he just sits there and does his thing, you know, <laughs> he's, He's so quick and so easy to work with. That's awesome. So what was it like working with Malcolm Young? He's probably one of the best guitar players I've, I've ever worked with. Mm. And I've worked with a couple of pretty good guys. That's awesome. You know, his, his sense of rhythm and timing is just unmatched by anything. And then just the way he gets the tone on his guitar, it's, it's quite quiet. There's hardly any distortion to it. And uh, uh, what a, what a, the way he plays it is when he does hit it hard, it starts distorting kind of within the guitar and then that goes into the amp. So he can really play electric, a heavy electric guitar with that, with real dynamics, instead of just being quieter and louder, it's actually the, the sound eases off. And then you, when he digs in, you can really hear those strings going, you know, so that's part of their sound, you know, and all their records, it's just two guitars, Mal on one side and Ang on the other side. And, and Angus is a more distorted, saturated sound, and, and Malcolm's that clean sound. And it's that marriage of those two sounds that, that create the that bigness, you know. Uh so he was he was an amazing guy. You know, he was definitely everybody kind of looked to him for guidance. You know, what do you think, Mal? Was that too fast, Mal? You know, so he was sort of the the big brother, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he learned a lot of his chops off his older brother George when they're doing the earlier records. So it was kind of that uh, hierarchy, I guess. They're just amazing. Every time, you know, you set up, like I said, you got to be ready in the studio because they, they walk in there and have a little tune. They may, uh, you know, may, we may play a little bit to sort out a tempo. Sometimes we'll, we'll time a click track to whatever tempo they're playing to. We'll play a little click track. Phil will start counting out and then we turn the click off and then they just play the song. And, you know, a lot of times they'd get it in like three or four takes, you know, each take just got a little better, a little better. And then, and then it's done you know and then we take a long break you know maybe an hour two hours and huh. sit there and drink tea and smoke six packs of cigarettes and say oh you want to try one more take of that song okay we'll go in and see if we can beat what we have and sometimes they did sometimes they didn't and so then we'd move on to the, so that was sort of just our our day you know it was never uh it was never work and there was a you know a lot of <laughs> fun talking and you know and every record's about the same with them you know there's not other than the, the studio's venues would change, uh, it was the same procedure every time. The brothers were, that that is the band, and everybody else was there to help with what they did. So, the, you know, they do all the writing, so now Angus does all the writing. The brothers always wrote most of the lyrics. I know Back of Black, Brian wrote a lot of the lyrics, and then after that, I'm not sure where it changed, but uh, the brothers would write a lot of the lyrics. Brian would throw his take in on, on stuff, but it was it's definitely... It's definitely uh, Angus's band. So if I may ask, when Malcolm passed, did it touch you personally? Oh, for sure. It's like, you know, losing a family member. Um, you know, I mean, it wasn't hugely shocking uh, because he had been sick for so long. And, you know, you knew that that's eventually going to be the end, you know, sort of like your old granny's, you know, 98. Yeah. And, you know, she passes away. It's sad and it's shocking, but it's not unexpected. But, you know, it's still like, Mal's gone. Holy smokes. Uh, so, yeah, that was that was a sad one. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's great that ACDC was able to continue. I'm sure Malcolm would have wanted that. You know what I mean? Yeah, you that's know? what that's what Angus says, that Mal would have wanted it. And, you know, uh, Malcolm and Angus had a big treasure trove of ideas and bits and pieces that uh, – that Angus has been able to draw on and and do these latest records anyways, you know. He had done, mm -hmm. um, see, Black Eye, what was the next one after that one? Uh, uh, the most recent one was Power Up. Power Up, and then the one before Power Up, we had done that Rock one. Or bust. That one was kind of Angus's tribute to Malcolm, right? So yeah. we figured that was done uh, with oh. Phil, with all his mm -hmm. uh, 
legal troubles, you know, yeah. and probably mm -hmm. could never get out of Australia again and tour because how can you tour with, you know, those kind of charges against you? Uh, uh, Cliff had said, you know, he was, he was retiring and that was it. Mm -hmm. Brian lost his hearing or had that, that difficulty. So we thought, well, you know, so when they booked the studio time to come up and start doing the power up, you know, we're all surprised. So nobody knew anything showed up at the studio and thought, well, what band has he got with him? You know, is Axel going to be singing? Is he, you know, hired the Guns N' Roses band? You know, what band is this going to be? So when I walked in and it was all the original guys, That's <laughs> like, awesome. oh my gosh, <laughs> we're, there was almost tears of joy. Uh, so that was, that was pretty, pretty cool. That is awesome. So, you know, I got to yeah. ask you, you, you mentioned right now that Rocker Bust, the 2014 record was sort of Angus's tribute to his brother, right? Rocker Bust. Yeah. yeah at, mm -hmm. at the time, though, um, Malcolm was still alive. He didn't pass for three years. So if I may ask, was it like, did they kind of know that it was coming, like that it was inevitable at that point? Well, he was he was not a part of, of anything. You know, he was at, uh, I guess, a, a state where he he was in a home and, you know, I, I know Angus would go in and visit with him and stuff, but he, it was the first time that Angus had done a record without Malcolm. Hmm. So to, you know, they had already written a songs, these songs together, but he was doing it without Malcolm. So I think in everybody's minds, that was, that was kind of going to be the last one. I mean, how, how could you go on without, without Malcolm? You know, he was one of the, you know, the, the main building blocks of the band, you know, so that was sort of this, you know, sentiment, sentiment on that record, you know, uh, it's the first one, all of us had been in a studio without Mal being there. So it was, uh, it's very bizarre for sure. Do you remember working on the title track for that record? That one might've been one of those pulling of the teeth songs. Hmm. It was, a, again, it was a bit different for them, you know, and it's just them all, sort of feeling feeling you know with with uh with mal not there anymore and you know i just remember that session was i wouldn't say a downer session but you know you could feel the lack of malcolm you know he was definitely in the room but you could there was a hole somewhere mm. and everyone was just you know playing through it and and everybody did a great job doing that but you know that's some of the memories i have when i hear some of those songs it's just oh yeah right that's the first one without mal yeah I mean, I, I want to ask you, um, because Mel is credited as being on that record, but was he, I guess, he wasn't as present, so to speak? Is that kind of, yeah. 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 Hmm. For you, for the guys in general, was it difficult making a record while, like, one of your band brothers is kind of, you can see the physical decline? Was that weighing heavily on you guys? Not, not really at the time. You would just see sometimes during the day there'd be, like, just weird little things, like... Uh, you know, you'd be playing along and then forget what song we're playing or something like mm. what, and then then it'd be all fine again. There was just little mm. bits. That you go, oh, that's not usual, and that that was about it. It wasn't like, what's wrong with Val or is he sick or like you know, there's not not any of that. But you could just tell that there was there was something not quite sometimes. You know, mm. right now it's it's all Angus is in charge. Mm. You know, and it used to be uh, Malcolm and Angus. And, you know, if there's a question that would uh, come from either Malcolm or Angus, uh, the other guys in the band are there as a support to what's going on with the song. So there's, when they're in the studio, there's, it's not like a regular band situation where, uh, you know, somebody, oh, hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we play this in the, you know, they come in with the song done here, band, here's the song. This is how, this is the song we're playing. Hmm. Now let's just find the vibe for it, you know. So it's not they're not coming up with parts. Gotcha. It's okay. Just yeah. Cool. So even so, even if Angus himself is kind of like improvising his guitar parts or so and so, overall the structure of the song is there. They're just kind of tweaking the the exact moment, so to speak. With that, yeah, be... it's more tempo that they're tweaking, <laughs> and uh, you know, just the vibe. How we plan? We're going to get more aggressive in the solo or in the chorus? Or are we going to? You know, how are we going to do this? They're not changing chords. They're not changing song structure. You know, they're just changing how how the performance of that piece. But the piece is now written. When the band's in there playing, the piece is written. And here here it is. You know, as they're playing it, Angus or, or even Brendan might say, hey, you know, let's, let's double, let's do the double chorus and then play out on the chorus of this one instead of having an ending. Or, hey, we need to put an ending on this song now. 
uh, that'll get tweaked as we're going. But structure and chord changes, that, that's all set in stone. You mentioned that ACDC is very off the cuff in the studio. Since things aren't like planned out, because things are off the cuff, is it hard sometimes to do multiple takes of things? Because like, you don't necessarily know exactly what to look for because it's kind of just all improv off the fly? Kind of. I mean, you know, they've got you know, the script of the song in their heads. So they know the the arrangement of it. So it's off the cuff as 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 far as the performance of it. And you know, because it's not done to a click track, you know, some parts may be a little faster than other parts. But that's why, you know, before we start the song, we'll run a click track. There's the tempo that, you know, we've decided the song sounds best at and turn that off and Phil's really good at staying within that tempo but when you're without a click what happens sometimes and I think part of the ACDC great thing is is when it comes to the chorus and everybody's sort of playing a little bit harder to get mm-hmm. built up to the chorus it'll go a little bit faster and then when they play softer to bring it down to the verse again they'll start playing a little bit slower and you can't do that with a click because you're always fighting it mm-hmm. so if it's done everybody's doing it together you as an audience, you don't feel it speed up and slow down. Hmm. It just there's just all of a sudden more energy, and then all of a sudden, oh, it relaxes, and there's more energy. So it's more dramatic, and that's that's how they play. So that they're actually doing a little dance with their music out there to get that dramatics into their songs. When you're recording them, do you like to record them live off the floor, or are there a lot of overdubs involved? Like from a technical angle, how do you guys approach recording them as an ensemble? as an ensemble everybody's out there playing as once we used to have brian out there singing vocals but we stopped that because you know after about five times you know he brian and brian's kind of done you know so we stopped doing that and to be honest sometimes at that point the the lyrics haven't always always haven't already been lit read either so uh but it's all hands on deck everybody's out there you're getting the interaction of you know phil and cliff and getting Mel and, and Stevie playing on top of that, you know, that's that's where the song gets its life from. You know, they're not a band where you can start with a drum loop or drum mm-hmm. pattern and then add to it. It's all it's all uh, live off the floor. It's always laid back. They're so uh, unassuming kind of guys, and that's why it feels like like you're a family and you're at home. You know, like mm-hmm. we always uh, eat dinner together. Uh, the last bunch of records, Angus's wife Ella had come out with a with a band, and at the the warehouse studio here in Vancouver, we got a big kitchen, so she'd sit there and cook us lunch and dinner. And say, okay, boys, lunch is ready, dinner's ready, or you know, and that's so cool. It was always a family thing. You know, okay, and we all sit there at the big table, and so so what did you do at school today? And you know, <laughs> and it's always just laid back and say, oh, gee, you better you better get back to work. Okay, let's have a quick smoke and we'll go back to it. And, so it's always laid back. 